everyone to another review by Fat Ninja Studios. I'm your host Jackie K and today we are breaking the multiverse with Spider-Man No Way Home. Before we get started, please give this video a like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to web that bell icon to stay up to date with our latest releases. Major spoiler warning ahead. The film begins where the last film left off with J. Jonah Jameson revealing the identity of Spider-Man, live on his Daily Bugle news series. Spidey and MJ are quickly enveloped by pedestrians on the street, and so he snatches her up to escape and finds somewhere quiet so he can wrap his head around what the heck just happened. Not only has his identity been revealed, but he's also branded as a murderer by the video that was released by Mysterio. He ends up back at his apartment and is confronted by Aunt May and Happy, who have just recently ended their fling. Not too long after, Damage Control shows up to haul Peter in for questioning. While guilty of being a vigilante under the Sokovia Accords, they don't find any evidence to suggest that he maliciously killed anyone, and through the aid of Matt Murdock, the daredevil himself, he is acquitted of his charges. In one small easter egg scene, a brick is thrown through Peter's apartment window, and Matt catches it, revealing he has some abilities of his own. Happy, however, is not so lucky. A few pieces of tech and weaponry from Stark Industries have gone missing and they were under his supervision. So he stands to face a trial all of his own. Matt informs him to get a really good lawyer, and personally, I'm assuming this is going to lead into the plot of She-Hulk, as Jennifer Walter is a defense lawyer, and the show is being billed as a courtroom drama. It could also spill out into the upcoming Armor War series, which I'm assuming that the tech wasn't sold or given away, but rather stolen, just as Walter tried to do in Homecoming, but by who remains to be seen. Perhaps Madame Hydra is involved and she's used her muscle, for example, U.S. agent, uh, to confiscate what she needs. Since their apartment is no longer safe, they move into one of Tony Stark's old properties, maxed out with all sorts of security and other gadgets. Peter tries to return to his normal life the next day when he goes back to school as a senior, but of course he's confronted by a mob of people, including his own classmates who are trying to snap their way to fame. Not everyone believes he's innocent of the death of Mysterio either. He escapes with MJ during study hall and they sit on the rooftop and shortly after they're joined by Ned discussing the trio's plans to go to MIT. However, given the recent controversy, Peter, MJ, and Ned are all denied entry into any of the schools that they've applied for. Feeling like he has no other choice, Peter goes to see Doctor Strange. We find out that Strange is not the Sorcerer Supreme due to a technicality, mainly that he didn't exist during the five-year blip, so Wong now has assumed the role. He asks Strange to go back in time and make it so Mysterio never reveals his identity, but given that the Time Stone has been destroyed, this is impossible. However, there is a spell that can make everyone forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Wong warns Strange against using it, but ultimately leaves it up to his judgment. As Doctor Strange casts the spell, Peter is reminded of all the people who matter to him, and how important it is for them to know his true identity. Just before the spell is completed, Peter screams out, Everyone who knew before Mysterio told the world should still know! But because this alters an already dangerous spell, in the middle of its completion, Strange quickly tries to shut it down and traps it in a magical cube device. He tells Peter that he screwed it up! Also, he and his friends could go to college, which a simple phone call would have corrected. To which Peter chimes in that he hadn't even thought about that, just talking to the board in the first place. So Strange kicks him out of the sanctum. This sets Peter on a path to find the lady in charge of admissions and try to convince her that his friends still deserve to go, that they had nothing to do with his vigilanteism. However, during this exchange, he is attacked by Dr. Octopus, and a big battle ensues on the bridge. 
Cars are thrown, people are nearly killed, and at the very last moment, Doc Ock tries to stab him with one of his tentacles, but the nano suit protects him. This reveals his face to Doc Ock, and he realizes it's not the same Peter Parker that he knows underneath the costume. The nano machines in Peter's suit have infiltrated the tentacles as well, and now have given Peter full control over them. As he tries to question Otto about what the heck is happening, they are interrupted again, this time by Green Goblin, where Otto mutters, Osborne, in disbelief. But just before Goblin can strike at Peter, they are teleported to a dungeon underneath the Sanctum. Here is where Doctor Strange explains the whole situation, that because the spell went wrong, it pulled in people from other universes who also knew Spider-Man's true identity, and while Strange was able to contain the spell, a few slipped through. He has already captured the Lizard, and now Doc Ock, and they need to capture the rest and send their asses back home. So Peter and his friends set out to find the missing baddies, starting with tracking Norman Osborn. However, their first lead has them cross paths with Electro. Aided by another fugitive villain, the Sandman, Peter is able to capture both of them and bring them back to the Sanctum. Electro recognizes the Lizard, while Sandman recalls that Doc Ock should be dead, which is news to him. Peter then receives a call from Aunt May, who says that one of the bad guys he's hunting just walked into her clinic. When he gets there, he is surprised to see just a plain, humbled Norman Osborn, confused about his whereabouts and confiding in Aunt May. He tells Peter that sometimes something takes over him and big chunks of time just go missing. Peter brings him back to the Sanctum, to which Strange immediately locks him up. And this is where Peter learns that each of them is supposed to die to an alternate version of himself. But something Aunt May said to him before he left the clinic sticks in his mind, and he tells Strange that he can't just send them back to their deaths, he has to try and help them somehow. Strange says it's impossible, the fate of the universe is at stake, and so they fight over the magical box that would otherwise send them all back to their respective realities. Spider-Man is able to steal the box and trap Doctor Strange in the Mirror Universe, and hatches a plan to make cures for all the villains. Some of them are curious and join him immediately, while others like the Lizard are more reluctant and don't want to be cured, but also don't want to end up dead. Peter takes the villains back to his complex and uses the Stark fabrication machine to make a new chip for Otto, which gives him full control over all the tentacles, and he is incredibly grateful. He then sets out to cure Electro of his powers when the spider tingle goes off and it's revealed the goblin is back in control. Meanwhile, J. Jonah Jameson has tracked Spider-Man to the building and is setting up a huge press conference outside. As Goblin begins to wreak havoc and battle Peter, Electro uses the moment to escape as well, as the Lizard and even the Sandman for some reason decides to join the bad guys. Doc Ock is knocked out of the building trying to help Peter, and eventually during the fight, Aunt May is killed by a gloating goblin. The villains all disappear into the night as the feds arrive to contain the situation, and Peter is forced to run. Meanwhile, MJ and Ned are waiting for word from Peter if they should activate the magic device when Ned suddenly discovers he's able to use the sling ring. He conjures up a portal, asking to see Peter Parker, and they do! But when he steps through, it's Andrew Garfield from the Amazing Spider-Man movies. After a few exchanges to prove he really is Spider-Man too, Ned tries again, and this time, Tobey Maguire appears. They show off some of their powers and make a few jokes, before Tobey asks MJ if she knows of a place where Peter would go to think, which she does. They find Peter on a rooftop in downtown New York, and try to comfort him over his loss of Aunt May, and the two alternate Peters introduce themselves to him. They reveal that they too have lost loved ones, Toby having lost his Uncle Ben, and Andrew having lost Gwen Stacy. Toby also remarks that it brought him down a dark path of revenge, and it still haunts him to this day. Peter brings up that he still wants to save them all if he can, 
as it's what Aunt May would have wanted. And they all agree to work on cures for each villain together. A montage of them working in a lab ensues, and when they finish all their work, they decide to put their plan in action. Using J. Jonah Jameson's broadcast, they go live at the Statue of Liberty to try and draw all the villains to one place. Their plan is to separate each one and give them their respective cures. But it doesn't go well at first, since our Spider-Man is the only one to have ever worked on a team before. The other two have never even heard of the Avengers or anything. They declare each other to be Peter 1 through 3, so they can call each other out during the fight and use their spider sense in cohesion with one another. Since Doc Ock is already cured, they don't have to worry about him, so their first target is Sandman. Once they get to him, they go after Lizard next and hit him with what looks like a Kryptonian gas grenade from Batman vs Superman. Then, Andrew and Toby are captured by Electro, and just before he can electrocute them to death, Doc Ock steps in saying he wants to do the honors. However, he betrays Electro, snatches off the protective arc device, and injects him with the cure while setting the other two Spider-Men free. With only Goblin left to go, Peter takes him on, and MJ is knocked out of the building but is saved in the nick of time by Andrew, making him weep for a moment as he wasn't able to save Gwen. Doctor Strange shows up, finally able to escape the mirror dimension, and is pleasantly surprised that Ned is able to use magic with no real knowledge. Nods to the Hobgoblin, perhaps? Strange uses his powers to try and keep the universe from tearing itself apart after Goblin messes with the magic box device. Harkening back to the end of the Loki TV series, where we saw big purple tears in the sky, but also kind of visually resembling the episode from What If, where we saw the universe collapse into nothing. Eventually, Spider-Man is able to get the upper hand on Goblin and delivers him a savage beating. And just as he's about to kill him with his own glider, Toby steps in to stop him and is stabbed for his efforts. He doesn't die, but this causes Peter to put aside his anger and give Osborne the injection instead. The rifts are growing incredibly out of control, and Peter figures out there is only one way to fix everything, by doing the spell as it was initially intended. Strange asks him if he's sure of this, because everyone, including Strange himself, will forget that Peter Parker ever existed, and Peter chooses to go through with it. He promises MJ and Ned that he will find them and remind them of who he is, and has a heartfelt goodbye with the other Spider-Men, and Strange casts the spell, sending everyone back and resetting everything. Or so we think! The following day, J. Jonah Jameson is still accusing Spider-Man of being a destructive menace, but this time without the information of his true identity. Peter visits the coffee shop where MJ works, but seeing the scar on her forehead and how happy she and Ned are that they got into MIT, he decides not to tell them. Instead, he puts on the suit and goes out into the night to protect the people of New York as the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. There are two after credit scenes, one involving Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock and Venom, where he's questioning the bartender about all the events in the MCU. But as Peter and Strange fix the spell, he's suddenly transported back to his own world, except he leaves a piece of the symbiote behind on the bar. The second post credit scene acts as a sort of trailer for Doctor Strange 2. It rehashes a few of the lines from the film where Wong warns Strange not to do the spell, and then we see the consequences of the spell. New York is covered in frost and coming apart. A quick shot of Strange walking down the aisle with Christine, Wanda showing up and building chaos magic in her hands, and then Doctor Strange showing up at her cabin in the middle of the forest from the end of WandaVision. We also see the hourglass at the center of the multiverse. We see Baron Mordo, who is living up to his promise to end magic everywhere. We see Shuma Gorath attacking in the streets of New York. And then finally, we see Doctor Strange versus... Doctor Strange, the evil, power-hungry version from What If. Overall, I thought the film was 
well worth the wait. As most films with bigger stories, there were quite a few pacing issues. The beginning felt slow and didn't really pick up until the other Spider-Men showed up, but the way they spun the whole tale was very well done. It combined several major Spider-Man comic storylines and still managed to give it their own unique flair. There were so many clever nods to the older films, and this is both amazing, but also a slight disadvantage to fans who never saw the classic films. We sometimes forget that those are from 20 years ago. I had some issues with the villains they chose and their motivations, particularly Sandman, who just jumped allegiances for no discernible reason, considering how in Spider-Man 3, he was more of a reluctant bad guy just trying to stay out of prison. On the other hand, they totally improved Jamie Foxx's Electro by giving him a taste of other universe electricity and craving that new feeling of power. I would also have liked to see a little bit more of Kirk Connors, aka the Lizard, as he was just mostly used in a henchman capacity. The real stars of the not-quite-sinister six were, of course, Doc Ock and his brilliant but lazy turn to the good side. And of course, the excellent portrayal of madness in Willem Dafoe's Norman Osborn. The death of Aunt May felt a bit too expected, and I don't know if it really truly needed to happen since Peter has had a mentor figure die when Tony Stark sacrificed himself in Endgame. But we do finally get the line, with great power comes great responsibility. So it all comes full circle. My biggest gripes with the movie were some of the forcefully injected humor moments during tense scenes, and that they kind of hand waved the whole spell going wrong, cracking open the multiverse thing, but I guess that's what the Doctor Strange sequel will dive further into. All in all, I give the film a big 8.5 out of 10. Go see this movie in theaters. Don't just wait for it to hit streaming. The MCU will never be the same. Big things are coming. I want to thank you all for checking out the video. Please give it a like, share, and subscribe to our channel. You can reach out to us on Twitter, at StudiosFat, or chat with us on Discord, linked in the description below. Our Patreon is now live, so check that out, also linked below. I've been your host, Jackie K, and before I go, sacrifices are an important part of life. That's not saying you shouldn't strive to have it all, but that sometimes you'll need to change or leave things behind in order to make progress. Never be too stubborn to admit that something isn't working and needs a new approach, or to ask for help when you just can't seem to do it all on your own. And if someone asks you for help, try to make time to step in and be the support that they need. Thanks again, and as always, take care.